Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Jan Strugnell. As Sharon said, uh, I'm based at James Cook University in Townsville, which is in far north Queensland. So that's uh, over a thousand kilometres north of Brisbane for those joining from overseas who may not know where it is. And my uh, co-presenter is Nerida Wilson and she's based in uh, the Western Australian Museum, which is in Perth. And so that's about 2,500 kilometres west of Adelaide. And so we realised that uh, together we significantly extend the geographic distribution of safe nodes in Australia and we're proud to do so. So today I want to talk to you about using genetics to understand diversity, uh, connectivity, demography, and I'll also say a bit about adaptation in the Southern Ocean. And so as Melody and uh, Jody both uh, stated, um, there's much more to life in the Southern Ocean uh, than uh, krill and uh, whales and seals and penguins. And those of you um, who perhaps watched the Australian Ocean Odyssey last night would have uh, thought, thought that that was uh, the, the only life in the Southern Ocean. But I'm here to tell you that there's much more than that. And the really interesting life is beneath the ocean surface. And so uh, the benthos, that's the life um, on the seafloor, the benthic marine life, uh, constitutes about 88% of life in the Southern Ocean. And uh, Melody said there's about 8,000 species that are known and our best estimates suggest that there's probably somewhere between 11,000 and 17,000 spe species. And so these, um, this uh, image here represents some of the diversity we see uh, in the Southern Ocean. So this includes things like sponges in the top left hand corner, which are big enough for a person to hide inside, sea spiders or pycnogonids uh, that can grow some species to be larger than your head, enormous isopods the size of dinner plates, tangles of nematean worms like you see on the bottom left there, and a really rich diversity of echinoderms. And here we see um, a brittle star in the bottom centre and also crinoids, which uh, sort of dance along the sea floor. And this benthos, the, this uh, marine life that's living on the sea floor, is even more interesting when you think about uh, the glacial history of Antarctica. So obviously in interglacial periods, um, like today that we see on the left hand side, there's plenty of room on the continental shelf for our marine life to live. Um, however, in uh, glacial periods, um, and we know that there's been many of these throughout the history of Antarctica, we have grounded ice sheets across uh, the continental shelf. And so this fact raises many questions, such as uh, where did the benthos come from? How does it persi persist? How uh, is it connected? How has it adapted to life uh, in Antarctica? And as geneticists, the tool we use to investigate um, the evolutionary history and the patterns we see today is DNA. So obviously, as well as providing the blueprint for organisms, it also provides a really powerful time capsule, which we can use to get a window on the past, uh, as well as patterns that we see today. And the reason for this is that it makes mistakes when it replicates itself. And so these uh, mistakes are passed on from um, parents to offspring. And so the DNA in an organism that we capture today really uh, provides a window on uh, the, the ancestry of that species as it contains a record of all of its ancestors. And so we can use this to investigate a number of different processes that we're interested in, in theme two. And these include things like diversity, also connectivity, uh, demographic processes like population expansion and contraction and also adaptation. And so I think that using uh, genetic tools will be really important for a number of safe objectives um, and I've summarised a few where I think it's particularly important here and so these include things like characterising the biogeographic history of populations to look at biodiversity trends and also uh, to build new eco-regional classifications also to uh, model spatial and temporal variation in biodiversity, to map, characterise and model uh, the environment, to look at drivers of biological structure and improve forecasts of change, 
Um, and also to use a combination of um, biological and physical methods to reconstruct ice sheet history. And so being able to work across uh, disciplines uh, and themes is a really exciting part of SAFE. And one of the really exciting uh, reason, uh, reasons that SAFE is so, so exciting and important is it really provides an important opportunity to sample regions in East Antarctica where we know very little. So these maps here represent uh, the images from the Southern Ocean uh, Atlas of Biodiversity. And on the left, you can see sites where, uh, that have been sampled for pelagic invertebrates. So this is invertebrates in the water column. And you can see that in East Antarctica, there's been a relatively a, um, a greater number of sites that have been sampled. And this reflects um, historic reasons that Australia has been particularly keen on sampling uh, krill and also other pelagic invertebrates using continuous plankton recorders. But if we look at the benthic uh, map on the right and look at sites that have been sampled from the seafloor, we can see that in East Antarctica, um, relatively few sites have been sampled. And so uh, SAFE is really um, quite exciting in that it will provide some opportunities to sample this life, which will enable us to get a better handle on diversity, connectivity, uh, population demographic processes and uh, adaptation. So why do we care about biodiversity and how can genetics help us learn more about it? So conserving the diversity that we have in the Southern Ocean is one of the goals of marine protected areas. And here are the existing and proposed MPAs. Um, and obviously MPAs are a really important tool for conserving diversity and also enhancing uh, resilience to environmental impacts. And to try and characterise biodiversity in the Southern Ocean, Previously, 23 ecoregions uh, were proposed, and these were based on previous uh, biogeographic patterns uh, and also um, abiotic surrogates for uh, diversity. Um, and so these include things like depth and geomorphic features and ice uh, and the like. And these were categorised as either drivers um, of uh, environmental drivers or perhaps also barriers to dispersal. So these really uh, represent hypotheses that we can also test using genetic data. So we can uh, use genetic data to look at connectivity between these regions um, and uh, to, to, really, uh, to, to really test this. So we can assign our individuals to different populations based on their genetic uh, history um, and to really see how connected different regions are. This is an example of where I've done that uh, with some colleagues in some previous work. So this is for an octopus uh, that we collected around uh, the Scotia Arc and also the Antarctic Peninsula. So in the coloured uh, plot, each vertical stripe represents an individual and the colour, our uh, colours of that stripe represents the population that it was assigned to. So we can uh, sample uh, genetic uh, material from these different individuals and assign them to populations to build up an idea of connection, connectivity between these different regions. And um, we can also start to incorporate environmental information to see how that has driven these patterns. Here is an example uh, from some work from my group. This isn't from the Southern Ocean, it's further north than that. Uh, but it demonstrates the point. So this is um, actually up around the African coast. This work was led by Katarina Silva from my group and in conjunction with Emma Young and colleagues from Bass. So in this work, we're actually looking at a lobster population. And in the, um, the maps uh, on the left, we simulate, uh, we use oceanographic models to look at um, connections from west to east and also from east to west. And then we can incorporate our genetic information uh, into this work and to look at connectivity both uh, that is occurring today, so contemporary migration, but also look at patterns in the past. So look at historical migration um, and get a picture of how these processes have changed with changing oceanographic currents and climatic change. We can also use genetic information to look up at diversity and assess diversity. So recently, Cassandra Brooks, who's part of SAFE and also Stephen Chown, 
uh, and, and colleagues investigated whether uh, the MPA shown here are representative of Southern Ocean uh, biodiversity. And they used um, these ecoregions as a proxy for um, biodiversity. And what they found is that uh, six of these ecoregions have 10% or more uh, no-take protection. And in their paper and in the original paper, the authors note that uh, the ecoregions didn't take into account genetic diversity, internal heterogeneity, or cryptic species. And cryptic species are super common in the Southern Ocean, and this is where we think we have a single species, and then uh, we look in with uh, further investigation, find that we have many, many species. And so we can ask whether these ecoregions are representative of genetic diversity that exists in the Southern Ocean. And that's what we're doing at the moment. So uh, currently, uh, Nerida um, and myself are conducting a spatial meta-analysis of genetic diversity indices. So we're taking all available um, genetic uh, information uh, that's publicly available uh, for benthic marine species and assessing, um, essentially summarising genetic information that we have uh, around the Southern Ocean for benthic communities. And this will enable us to build up a picture of hotspots of genetic diversity around the Southern Ocean. So watch this space. In addition, uh, as well as um, capturing uh, animals in targeted campaigns and um, extracting DNA and, and using that to, as, a, as a source of genetic material, we can also use environmental DNA or eDNA which is um, really becoming a very popular method for assessing diversity, for assessing change over time, um, and is also becoming an increasingly important method for looking at invasive species. Um, so environmental DNA is essentially trace DNA that occurs uh, in the environment. So this can be from um, feces or from skin or malts or metabolic waste, and it can be obtained through filtering water through uh, sediment samples. And there was an interesting paper last year which actually used sponges uh, as a natural um, environmental sampler to filter, um, filter DNA. So I think that um, environmental uh, DNA uh, methods and, and in fact, uh, developing um, methods for specifically probes for um, uh, introduced species and invasive species is particularly really interesting in the safe context and potentially could even be deployed to some extent on ships of opportunity, like tourist ships, where perhaps samples could be taken to um, a, 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 of the water, for example, to, uh, to search for invasive species or species of interest. What I think is uh, a really exciting um, development in uh, DNA in, in, in genetic studies and it's becoming increasingly more uh, powerful of late is demographic analyses and by this I mean looking at population expansion and contraction over time. So this is an example led by Ira Cook. It's actually a tropical example but shows the ability um, to look at change in population size over time. So on the x-axis here we have back about 1 million years up to um, the present day and on the y-axis is effective population size. And so this work actually uses two whole genomes. Um, uh, and so uh, one shown essentially in the orange and one in the blue. And we can see quite fine scale changes in population size uh, over time. So I think that um, this is particularly interesting for um, Antarctic biologists, but also perhaps um, in more of the physical science community because we're interested in looking at um, refugia back over time to understand where did our um, Southern Ocean benthos live during these glacial periods. And the same goes for terrestrial species as well. So I think it's really interesting to apply these kinds of analyses so we can look at change in population size over time. And for us, as I said, in biological communities, this is talking about uh, refugia um, and for physical scientists, this is the ice-free areas. So I think these kinds of analyses represent a really interesting area where we can work across disciplines and themes to, to understand more about these processes. 
Finally, I just wanted to say a tiny little bit about adaptation. So this is using the same study as before. And our ability uh, to sequence whole genomes is really increasing at a rapid rate because uh, the cost is coming down uh, all the time and technologies are really improving. So this is an example using 148 whole genomes of a coral. And up uh, the top here is a Manhattan plot. So you can see um, the entire genome size of uh, these coral, uh, coral species, so 500 megabases long. And here we've done a selective sweep analysis. And so you can see uh, we can detect regions of the genome that are under selection. And then we can uh, look at some detail at these particular regions and then really find genes in the region that are under selection. So in this analysis here, we're focused on looking at adaptation to freshwater environments. But these kinds of analyses, I think, um, are, are really important and interesting in the Antarctic context as well. So looking at adaptation to, to rapidly changing environmental conditions. And an example could be um, uh, comparing adaptation between sub-Antarctic islands and the continent, for example. So this is really enabling us to look um, at, at selection at a really fine scale and, and really see the genes that are responsible for these changes. And I think that's quite exciting. Finally, I just wanted to say thanks for listening. Um, I think SAFE is a super exciting opportunity to work across themes. I'm excited about the multidisciplinary opportunities. Really look forward to working with you all um, and to be delivering some really important um, real uh, important management outcomes. Um, so that's a really exciting space to work in. Um, and I'll do my best to answer any questions and we'll deflect the difficult ones to narrow it up. Thank you.